Hi, I'm Alex, and this is Tank Tested, and today we're talking Marimo balls. I have my set of five here, and I love them, but at the end of this video, I'm destroying them. And you should destroy yours as well, because right now, Marimo balls might be the largest threat to the aquarium hobby, ecosystems around the United States, and the livestock that live there. We're going to dive into why in a minute, but it all comes down to a little invasive species that's hitching a ride on them called the zebra mussel. Today, to help me explain the problem with marimo balls, I'm joined by two guests. Cara Wade is a biologist and GIS analyst who focuses on aquatic habitat restoration, as well as monitoring endangered species. She's also been in the planted aquarium hobby for more than two decades. Casey Williams is an aquatic plant ecologist who specializes in aquatic invasive species remediation. He's also a planted tank hobbyist. Kara, I wanted to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit, uh, level set with us, what marimo balls are and where they come from? Sure. So marimo balls are also called moss balls, but they're not a moss. Uh, they're an algae. Uh, the species is Agagropola linnaei, and they're known for coming from Japan, but they're also native to uh, watersheds across northern Europe in cold water. And they're popular within the hobby because they're cute, kind of whimsical in appearance um, as this algae growing in a globular form that can roll around in the tank. Right. And Casey, can you share with us what's happening right now? What is the crisis that's emerging with the Marima ball? Well, apparently uh, about a week or a week and a half ago, um, they were, they were uh, noticed by a pet store uh, employee uh, with uh, zebra mussels, um, and that was in Oregon, and that was uh, about March 4th or 5th, I believe. Uh, since then, they've been found in about 12, 12 or 15 states, um, including Canada. So they've um, pretty much moved across the United States um, with this invasive zebra mussel. No telling how many people have bought them. Uh, and this is a new vector for this species um, that probably most, most people have not really thought of previously. And uh, just for context, I think we're actually up to uh, more than 20 states now have ID'd the Marima, or the Marima Vols as being carriers of more than 30. zebra mussel. More than 30, wow. Um, but yeah. in addition, um, Zebra mussels are probably the worst possible thing that could be living on these marimo balls. Uh, can one of you explain what a zebra mussel is? A zebra mussel is a, um, it's a bivalve. So it's um, a mussel or a clam in the clam family. Uh, they generally uh, are native to middle, middle Europe or so. They were um, brought over to uh, United States middle mid 1980s or so so they've been here about 40 years uh and they were brought over um in ballast water from uh, ships uh ground zero for them in the united states was the great lakes and the upper mississippi drainage basin and since then they've worked their way down the mississippi drainage basin um, and they've spread into a few other drainage basins uh, since then so far the western united states um have not had too many infestations, uh, but they are moving south. So Texas, uh, Louisiana, and Arkansas have all had recent occurrences. Um, and uh, they're just a major pest. Uh, a lot of issues with uh, clogging up water, water pipes and water, water works. Uh, they um, eat algae, so they basically disrupt the food chain of a reservoir or lake. Um, and so they're, yeah, they're a bad deal. And uh, Carol, why exactly is it such a concern that they're on the marimo balls? I mean, we keep them in our aquariums. Why is that a risk to our waterways? So these mussels are extremely fecund. They can reproduce very, very rapidly. Uh, I think a single female is, is known for 
producing over a million eggs in one year. Um, so what this means is that if you have them in a tank and, um, and there is enough of a food source for them, they can potentially be pumping out a lot of eggs, which become the, uh, the larval form. And those are invisible to the naked eye. So a standard water change could mean that you end up pumping this stuff down your drain and introducing them into your local watershed without ever possibly even knowing they're there. And when we're talking about this, uh, we know that they have shown up in about 30 states in the last week or so. How long ago do we think that the uh, zebra mussels may have made their way into the Miramobile supply? Do we have any idea? Um, maybe. I mean, most of what we're all piecing this together, just like Fish and Wildlife is trying to do. Uh, I did see one article where the employee who put in that first report said he was consistently finding zebra mussels in the marimo balls uh, for months by the time they, they got back to him with his report. So he stated three months. Um, the fact that it could have been going on for months and the one week that they started looking, it's confirmed across 30 some states or more in the US indicates that it's likely a much, much larger problem than a single batch coming in to the US and Canada. This has likely been going on for months, if not years, and none of us have noticed it. So the issue with the zebra mussels being in our aquarium hobby is that they can spread into our waterways. And if they've been out there for months or possibly years, uh, the damage may already be done. But if it's not already done, we as a hobby have a responsibility to take action now. So uh, Casey, if a hobbyist like myself, who has a little container of Marimo balls, right? or they have marimo balls in their aquarium, what is the right thing to do to make sure that we're not responsible for an outbreak of one of the most invasive or invasive species uh, that have ever hit North America? Well, the authorities have, um, have been uh, listing quite a few different uh, methods from soaking them in Clorox bleach and vinegar, uh, freezing, freezing them for a long period of time, putting them in boiling water, a um, bunch of different things. I personally would recommend putting them in a Ziploc container or a Ziploc bag and sticking them in the freezer for about 24 hours. Um, this would uh, contain the marimo the balls and, um, and then it would also give, uh, give the mussels a chance to desiccate and freeze. And um, if you tried to Clorox them, you may not add the right amount of Clorox um, to kill everything because some of the mussels, if they're larger and older, they can actually close up and protect themselves from any sort of contamination. So they can actually survive a Clorox bleach dip if you don't do it um, exactly correctly. So freezing seems to be, uh, in my opinion, the best method just to make sure that you're killing everything. Okay. And to add a little one more layer of complexity. Uh, if I were to look at my marimo ball, I might be able to visually inspect and say, oh, there's no, there's no zebra mussels here, right? But that doesn't mean that they're not there. Uh, can, Kara, can you talk a little bit about the life cycle of them? Because I know that they have a very uh, microscopic uh, juvenile form that is the real risk here. Sure. So even if you have a marima ball that does not appear to have any in it, um, they are a very small muscle and they are first going to settle out onto a surface to grow um, into the visible form uh, from the larva. And they could be, you know, less than an eighth of an inch uh, in size, uh, you know, the size of a sand of grain, uh, a grain of sand. And um, so even visual inspection may not be enough to detect them. Uh, it would be a, a good idea to simply remove them from the tank and get rid of them. Yeah, even, uh, even adult zebra mussels, average size is um, probably about the size of your pinky, pinky fingernail. So they do not get very large. Uh, 
which is probably why they've gone unnoticed for so long if they have been in these balls. Um, just no one would really ever notice them because they don't get that big even as adults. So um, even careful inspection, you know, may not pick up larvae or, or anything that's noticeable. And to add to that, uh, if you have Miramar balls in a uh, communal aquarium, you know, I'm lucky. I kept mine in this little container, right? They're contained. But if you have them in a communal aquarium, those uh, larval mussels may have migrated either to other parts of your aquarium or even to the filtration of your aquarium. So when you're freezing the marimel balls, how do you deal with the fact that there may be uh, zebra mussels within the aquarium and doing a water change could be dumping those larval forms into the waterway? Uh, so in general, the three uh, words for Zebra mussel eradication is clean, drain, and dry. Um, and that's what we see a lot on, um, on signs and stuff around Texas to prevent them from spreading. And I would use that same advice in your aquarium. Clean it, uh, or drain it, clean it, and dry it. And um, that should take care of the problem. Anything, um, any, any plumbing or pump pieces, uh, filter media that should all be drained and allowed to dry, preferably out in the sun for a period of time. Uh, Kara, is there anything that you would add to that? Anything that people should be aware of? I think Fish and Wildlife right now is recommending that if you do find any zebra mussels uh, in your marima balls, that you should drain and then bleach everything in the tank. So that means the substrate, any other plants, your filter media, anything else. Um, if you if you do not find any um, that are large enough to detect with the naked eye, I don't think they're recommending that at this point, just simply removing the marimo balls from the tank. That's good to know. Uh, so as an aquarist, uh, I think that we have a responsibility to make sure that our hobby doesn't impact the local ecosystems. Uh, is there any example of past instances where the aquarium hobby has been less responsible and as a result there's been an invasive species uh, introduced into our waterways that kind of can act as a cautionary tale? Oh, I think Casey should take this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is his full-time job. <laughs> Um, so in Central Texas, we have three mollusks currently that have been introduced directly from the aquarium trade. Uh, we have melanoides, uh, we have giant ram's horn snail, and now we're beginning to see signs of the apple snail. And uh, all of these mollusks are living in a uh, very very um, sensitive habitat for sensitive species. And so it is of a very big concern. Melanoides has spread pretty much across the state of Texas um, and it has had several impacts um, for endangered species. Giant ram's horn snail is pretty limited since it is a herbivore, um, it's pretty limited to only the really limited waterways in this, but it, it too has had some pretty uh, deleterious effects. And then now we're beginning to get this apple snail, um, which again is a partially a herbivore, and they're beginning to see it uh, chew and eat certain res restored areas of rivers and wetlands. So we know that um, this is this is nothing new. These things have, have been uh, brought in from for the aquarium trade, and they've now been released. And so uh, definitely a cautionary tale on any new species that, that someone may want to keep or that industry may want to bring in um, to, to maybe think twice on, on that. And Casey, uh, can you elaborate when you say that these are sensitive ecosystems, what is the harm in an extra snail or an extra mollusk making their way into the waterway? How, is that really that bad? 
Well, so uh, the term, the, um, the melanoides, for instance, uh, apparently harbors a, a parasite. And this parasite attaches to the gills of fish. Um, and there's one, one specific endangered species called the fountain darter uh, that lives in some of the springs in central Texas. And this parasite has drastically um, impaired the population of, of this fish because Parasite has infected the gills of this fish. This fish is sensitive to this parasite, and basically the parasite will suffocate this fish. So we've seen um, instances of population decline because of this parasite, or at least the, the um, fountain darter just is not doing all that great in general um, because it is infected. So that is, um, that's one thing. We, we don't know exactly when you introduce a species if it's going to have really bad consequences or if it's just going to be general nuisance. But, um, but we're beginning to find out that a lot of these species actually do have un, uh, really unintended um, effects on these systems that we normally wouldn't think of. And uh, let's say that we have hobbyists that don't care as much about the ecosystem uh, as they do about their hobby. Is there any risk for if aquarists don't take action and be responsible now, that it's going to lead to less freedom and accessibility of products in the aquarium hobby? So a lot of us tend to think that this problem doesn't affect me immediately, so I don't need to take action. But the bigger problem is that the hobby as a whole has a really poor reputation uh, at the federal level uh, among inv invasive t species task forces and so on. So when you're talking about the, the remediation and combating the effects of just zebra mussels alone being in the hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Um, and, and that's just in the, the Great Lakes area, that's not counting the efforts in, in other states. The hobby is very, very small and uh, is not considered a, a really integral um, part of uh, the US economic system. And if they have to regulate us, they will. And here in Texas, that nearly happened about 12 years ago uh, when a whitelist, species whitelist, nearly went through. And that would have limited every plant that we could keep as aquatic plant hobbyists to what was on that list. Um, there would be no stores getting in a broad selection. There would be no ordering from other states and getting the newest, coolest varieties. Uh, it would have drastically impaired what we could do as hobbyists. And fortunately, it didn't go through. But the worse the hobby looks, um, you know, nationwide, uh, just as our reputation uh, and intractability in working with regulators, uh, the more likely that that is to happen. Right. So at its core, even though it's not our fault that these zebra mussels have come in from, we think, uh, Eastern Europe, um, mm -hmm. it is our responsibility to take action to make sure that our hobby stays the hobby that we want it to be and not yeah. uh, the hobby that it will be if we can't prove that we're responsible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would be devastated if what I was allowed to keep legally was limited uh, through whitelists or regulations not allowing for importation of a lot of plants. Um, and I think a lot of hobbyists will. We, we enjoy the challenge of picking up new species and getting to try new things. Um, and that could change in an instant. Um, so a big part of this is a good faith effort moving forward in dealing with these challenges, even if we weren't the ones that caused them. Uh, Casey, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I will add that um, uh, there are very many states that will really take this uh, very seriously. And I would not be surprised if we start seeing some changes in regulations, some uh, some opinions uh, coming out here pretty soon on how to how to regulate uh, some things or inspect things. Um, there's definitely going to be some sort of change in in state regu state regulatory bodies on this issue that we haven't seen in the past, just because this is such a widespread and rapid issue. So right. be, be prepared. And, yeah. And from my perspective, uh, 
you know, and I speak only for myself here, like, I think that if we can't protect our local ecosystems, then we should be held responsible. You know, the reality is that your home aquarium should never be at the cost of the local ecosystem outside your door. Um, right. We need to be stewards of our environment. Um, Kara, I was curious, can you give us a little insight into instances where the zebra mussel has gone um, out of control? You mentioned the Great Lakes earlier. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happened in the Great Lakes? Right, as Casey mentioned, the Great Lakes was the first area where zebra mussels uh, were introduced in the ballast water from ships. And since then, they, uh, they proliferated and they have filled the pipes um, for hydroelectric dams and for water transport through non-hydro dams um, and for water infrastructure concerning processing of drinking water. Um, so all of those have to be cleaned out. Um, and then you have the ecological devastation of them filtering out, uh, you know, all of the, the microscopic material suspended in the water column that was the basis of the food chain for other organisms. Um, and I know just, just speaking personally here in central Texas, we just had an introduction of, of zebra mussels confirmed in the last few years. And I believe it was about a year year and a half ago that they had to treat them um, in the pipes for uh, potable water for, for the water supply. Wow. And the result when they treated them is it killed off the mussels, which the water was, was potable, it was drinkable, but it had dead mussels in it and it was coming out of people's taps, cloudy, gray, and smelling like dead mussels. Um, right. So that's a, that's a way that you do not want to encounter zebra mussels. Yeah, I mean, that's a strong enough incentive of you don't want your tap water to taste like rotting mussels. So maybe we should take action now. Mm -hmm. um, one last question, Casey. Uh, if people want the best information of what to do and what's happening, is there a place where people can be going to get that information directly from you know, fish and game or something like that? Where, where can people go? So pretty much every state will have a uh, aquatic nuisance, aquatic um, nuisance invasive aquatic species task force. So uh, you could Google your state's uh, wildlife or um, parks and wildlife department. Um, USGS has a pretty good updated uh, website on invasive species. You can just Google USGS zebra mussels or USGS Asian carp. So um, just look on Facebook and Google some different resources. There's plenty of uh, information out there, so. Great. Uh, so I, before we, we wrap up fully, I want to give each of you the opportunity. Uh, uh, Carol, I'll start with you. Is there anything that you feel like we need to convey that we haven't conveyed yet? I, I, I would say that I'm very surprised by this. There were, there were invasive species yeah. that I could see coming and this was not the threat I saw coming. So um, there's other things in the hobby uh, that I was very concerned about as being the next big issue. Um, but zebra mussels being inside marimo balls was was not that. And I think it's a good lesson that that we need to be alert and we need to be proactive. We need to look at um, propagation techniques because this was clearly introduced at the farm um, and uh, and so things need to happen from our hobbyist level all the way up to the top in in um, commercial propagation to responsibly engage with the hobby right and casey is there anything that you would like to add yeah i agree with cara uh, this was definitely a new vector um, and distribution method that I don't think anyone saw coming. Uh, and there, there's going to be um, definitely some backlash, I believe, on this. So uh, I think as Aquarius probably should take a proactive approach um, and be willing to open the communication uh, first before the states try and force communication on you. Um, so I would definitely uh, advise 
a proactive approach from 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 the hobbyist uh, on this and looking into the future. Great. Well, Cara, Casey, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank sure. Thank you for having me. So now the hard part. I'm lucky. My marima balls are contained. I will be freezing them, per Casey's suggestion, and I'll be boiling the water that they're held in, just to make sure that I don't accidentally dump any mussel larva down my drain. But if you have marimo balls in your home aquarium, the decision may be much more challenging. And I understand that it is a hard decision to rip apart your established aquarium. But it is our responsibility as aquarists to do what is right and to protect the ecosystems that we live in. Because ultimately, our hobby can never be more important than the natural world that surrounds us. This is an opportunity for us to do the right thing, and us doing the right thing could save entire ecosystems. So with that, I hope that this has been informative. I hope that it has inspired you to take action, and I hope you have a great day.